Okay, I think we're recording now, so I'll start the presentation. Welcome to this webinar where we're going to look a little bit under the hood, I guess, and try and uh, get a, a better sense of how iLinks work and how video based eye tracking works in general. I think it's genuinely the case that the kind of the more you understand how your eye tracker works, the, the better able you are to be always sure that you're collecting high quality data. It becomes intuitive when you understand what the eye tracker is trying to do, what it is that you need to do in order to allow it to do its job the best it can. So I'll start with a very brief history of eye tracking, history of eye tracking that's kind of related to the kinds of techniques that are currently used in, in video based eye tracking. And then I'll go on to talk a little bit about the basic principles of video based eye tracking and in particular what's known as the pupil CR or technically the pupil minus CR technique and, and why that's used and why it's important. And as part of that discussion I'll consider the role of thresholds which you'll be familiar with if you've used an eye link and end up with a consideration of how calibration works, what it's really doing, the maths that goes on under the hood. And if we've got time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about other host computer, host PC functions and the role of the link between the two computers, the eye tracking computer and the stimulus computer. And that's the link that gives us eye link. If at any point you've got questions, like I say, just shout out or um, feel free to, to type in the in the chat box. So I could do a whole webinar on uh, early eye tracking efforts and, and may well if uh, people are, remain unable to get to their labs for much longer. But um, one of the first efforts that I thought I'd just mention briefly is this one here, which involves actually kind of placing a, a metal rod in, on sort of gluing it into a piece of plaster of Paris that was then stuck on the, the front of the eye, the cornea, and that rod linked to a little pivot wheel. And, um, and the pivot wheel had a needle on it and the needle essentially kind of traced a path and the path it traced depends on whether the, or where the eye moves. The most amazing thing about this technique was that this needle here was actually electrified and it would create sparks. And the sparks it's created were linked to a 100 hertz tuning fork. So you'd bang this tuning fork, stick it on a board and the board would wobble and make two little electrical contacts against each other 100 times a second. So 100 times a second, you've got a little spark flying out the end of this needle, which is attached to your eye. And this spark would burn holes in the paper. And this is the result. And if you've ever sort of looked at these kind of raw eye movements, you can tell this is somebody reading. These kind of big burned holes are when the eye is fixating. And these sort of streaks of dots between them but there's a cave and it's kind of remarkable. You can count the number of dots and measure the duration of the saccades. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably a 70 millisecond saccade there. And then this is the big saccade back, big fast saccade back to the beginning of the next line of text. So early on, it was surprising how sophisticated people were in their ability to record eye movements. Let me get back to my mouse. So another early effort was the Dodge photochronograph. And this one's important because it kind of actually uses one of the principles used by modern video eye tracking, which is the idea of recording the reflection of a light on the cornea. And again, it used this sort of tuning fork trick to achieve surprisingly accurate uh, recordings. These are recordings from a group of patients with various psychiatric and neurological illnesses. And this is a saccade task where you have a fixation here, a saccade to the right. And you can see quite clearly what looked to me like small, very small corrective saccades. These look suspiciously like square wave jerks. I'm not sure they can be. But um, again, an early effort that showed fairly remarkable levels of accuracy. This is smooth pursuit data here, somebody was following a, 
swinging pendulum, sort of eye curves smoothly to the right and then to the left. And these are patients with dementia precox, schizophrenia as we call it now, and you can see this kind of saccadic pattern of tracking where there's no real pursuit, there's fixations followed by saccades, followed by fixations, and then saccades. So again, this was created by shining a bright light onto an eye and essentially recording where that reflection of the light off the front of the eye fell on a photographic plate. Let me get back to my drawing. Oh, give me my cursor back. Um, like all clever inventions, nothing really much came of um, Diefendorf and Dodge's machine and not a lot of eye tracking went on until the 60s and 70s and then the Russian scientist Yarbus picked up on this idea and again using this idea of recording but this time with video well not video but sort of cine cameras back then um, people were able to or he was able to essentially create an artificial corneal reflection so rather than reflecting off the cornea itself this is a little mirror this is a sort of suction device that stuck as the um the mirror onto the cornea so this looks to me somewhat terrifying because if this is a mirror this is basically a piece of glass and that's your cornea <laughs> the two things look incredibly close together um some other versions of this use radioactive glowing blobs of dye that were kind of painted onto the eyeball again which can't be much fun but the basic idea was that you could use these cameras to record the path of the light that was reflected from these little mirrors and uh sorry somebody's trying to chat at me on some other device i'll try and turn that off in a second and using this technique Yarbus was able to create the classic images which are familiar to so many people that use eye tracking these kind of traces of the paths where the eye goes um, there's another technique that involves using light or infrared light known as a sort of limbal reflection technique and that is based on the idea that you can shine an infrared light source on the eye and then measure how much of the eye how much of that light bounces back onto some kind of receptor and essentially the idea is that the amount of light that bounces back depends on how much of the sclera the sort of solid white bit of your eye the light is falling on compared to the pupil and the iris which are much less solid and absorb much more of that infrared light so depending on how much infrared light falls on the whites of your eye compared to the iris and the pupil of your eye, you'll get a larger or smaller amount of that light being reflected back onto these sensors. And you can have a whole array of these sensors and use that to determine the left and the right. This is an old device that I did most of my early eye tracking research with in schizophrenia papers called the uh, scalar iris. Another technique which doesn't involve imaging the eye is to use a search coil so this is a contact lens essentially with a coil of wire wired around it in a figure of eight shape the advantage of this technique is it allows you to sort of recover not just the rotation of the eye in the x and the y axis but also in the z kind of rotation axis the eye sort of rotates as well when it moves and this is one of the only techniques that allows you to kind of recover that essentially you kind of run a very small current through this wire and a current through this kind of necker cube device and the kind of difference in currents that is created when this thing moves in these currents here is picked up and measured it's a very very accurate way of measuring eye movements but it's very invasive it involves putting this very large um, contact lens on people's eyes and then that can cause corneal scarring and things like that so for these reasons the sort of inadequacies and the difficulties of recording via other techniques as technology developed 
people started to sort of look at other ways. One of the last sort of alternative techniques I'll look at is the dual Purkinje eye trackers. These are important and relevant because again they make use of these corneal reflections. If you shine a light in somebody's eye, like a torch, if you're in a dark field in the middle of nowhere, somebody shone a torch at your eye, if somebody looked closely in your eye you would see a reflection of the beam of that torch. There are actually four different reflections from the front of the cornea and the back of the cornea. These tend to be very, very close in space. And when you look at them, they, they, they sort of merge into a single one. Then there's a third cornea, um, Purkinje image they're called, that reflects off the front of the lens and the final one that reflects off the back of the lens. And that fourth Purkinje image is visible through the pupil so you have to look very very carefully through somebody's pupil and you can see the reflection off the back of that and critically and this is an idea that is picked up and we'll talk about in a bit in pupil cornea um, pupil minus cornea reflection tracking the idea is that this reflection moves independently because it's part of the eye compared to the reflection off the front of the eye so here you can just about see the fourth Pekim G image there through the pupil and the first and second sort of blended images there on the front. And obviously one of the disadvantages of dual Pekim G eye trackers is that depending on how dilated people's pupils are, you have more or less of a chance of still being able to see this fourth Pekim G image depending on where the eye is rotated. But they're fascinating devices still in use in some cases. One of the other disadvantages though is that they generally required people to keep their heads very, very still in order to work. And one of the only ways of achieving that was to use this device here called a bite bar. Back when I started eye tracking, bite bars were a, a very common thing. And one of your jobs as the experimenter was to kind of periodically wipe up the dribble of your participants because it's very easy to start drooling basically when you've got your teeth clamped around these uh, dental molds but as you can see these are kind of large devices they're monocular if you wanted to do binocular eye tracking you needed two dual Purkinje eye trackers next to each other and uh, they were quite remarkable devices and again very very accurate but had limitations including a sort of very small trackable range the, ra the range of eye movements you could make the amount of rotation you could use before the the Fourth Bikini image was uh, was lost. So that was a brief kind of run through of uh, previous technologies that have been used to try and image the eye or get some sense of where the eye is in space. And what I'll talk about now is the technique that pretty much all modern eye trackers, not all, you can still use EOG, for example, and put, put electrodes next to people's eyes. But most eye trackers now, the ones that are used for research, are video based systems and essentially the idea is that they point a video camera of some sort or another typically a high speed one at the eye and record a film or live images of the eye and then use image processing techniques to try and extract from this image some key landmarks and typically these key landmarks are the center of the pupil and the center of the corneal reflection, the first, the sort of merged first and second Purkinje images. And this is typically a reflection of an infrared light source, and I'll come on to why that is in a bit. It's worth pointing out that there are two different types of video-based eye tracking. You can either track what's called using the dark pupil technique, which is what the eye link uses, or some eye trackers, some Tobies, can use both a dark and a bright pupil technique. You've all seen a bright pupil. You'll see it when you take a photo with your phone or your camera and the flash goes off and you get this red eye. It's the light reflected directly back out through the pupil from the, um, the back from the retina, essentially. So it makes a difference because in the image processing algorithms you're either looking for something that's circular and dark or something that's circular and bright as i say the eye link systems use dark pupil tracking and what they're doing is looking to find a dark circle in the images that they're processing so how do eye links work 
there are three critical components for all iLink systems. This is an iLink 1000 you can see here. They're an infrared light source, and that's really just a bank of infrared LEDs that shine out, just like a security camera has a bank of LEDs around it to provide an infrared light source. And the camera, so that's the first component. The second component is a camera. In the iLink's case, it's a high-speed video, digital video camera. And importantly, that camera is operating in the infrared spectrum. In other words, it can't really see anything unless there is some source of infrared light that is illuminating the object that it's trying to see. And you can see here, it's also a black and white camera. And the reason that you can see this person's face is because the person's face is being lit up by the infrared light coming from the torch here that sits next to the camera. The third and final component, which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute, is the host computer, which is where all of the images from this camera are sent. And this host computer does a lot of online processing and image processing, and I'm going to talk about those aspects in a second. This is just a version of, or a diagram of the portable duo, in case people are familiar with that version of our eye tracking systems. And again, illustrating the same idea that there are two key components, a high-speed video camera and an infrared torch. So as I've mentioned, the infrared light source, the torch, if you like, has two purposes. The first is to provide some kind of light source so that the camera can see anything at all. And the reason, or one reason we operate and the camera operates in the infrared spectrum is because we can't be sure what the kind of local luminance levels could be. It could be that the lights are on or off or somebody might turn the light on half the way through. We don't want what the camera can see to be limited by the local luminance conditions. So we provide our own illumination, if you like, thereby being able to control it, ensure that it's consistent and at the right strength. So here you can see a face and the face is visible with an iLink camera because the face is being illuminated by infrared light. The second purpose, and this is a critical one, of the infrared light source is that it provides a reflection. So this little light blue dot here is literally the reflection of the torch, this bunch of LEDs shining onto the eye and onto the face. So these two things, as we'll see, become very, very important, in particular, the corneal reflection. The video camera is just a video camera. It's taking a lot of images, up to 2,000 a second for the iLink 1000 Plus, and the iLink 1000 and the portable duo. Typically, 1,000 frames per second or 1,000 images per second would be usual. And as I've said, the third component is the host computer, which runs what, a real-time operating system. So because it's having to receive a thousand images every second, and it's having to do some very, very complicated image processing on these images within a millisecond, it needs to be able to do that very, very rapidly. And if you tried to run it in an operating system like Windows or Mac OS, which would be constantly trying to kind of, I don't know, index your hard disk or send information back to Microsoft or whatever they're doing, you run out of processing cycles, basically. So we use a sort of pared down minimal operating system on the host computer in order to be able to perform these very, very complex image processing tasks. Somehow, and via a process that I'll go through in a bit of detail, it manages to process these images and compute gaze location. And by gaze location, I mean what pixel on the screen that the participant is looking at are they currently looking at. So its job or its key job, if you like, is to return and record gaze data. And by gaze data, I mean where the person's looking in some kind of coordinate space, typically the coordinate space of your screen, that makes sense because you know where on your screen your stimuli are. It also, and again, I'll touch on this, parses the data in real time. In other words, it makes decisions about whether the eye is currently in a fixation or a saccade. I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Finally, it stores the data to disk and then transfers that data back to your 
stimulus computer at the end of the task. So how does the camera work? It's, as I've said, a digital camera. It's not a color camera, it's a black and white camera, but like all digital cameras, it essentially has a sensor. And that sensor is a grid, an array of pixels, each one of which has its tiny little lens, which focuses light. So thousands and thousands of these little sensors focus light. And underneath the sensors are a photodiode, which essentially release voltage depending on how much light falls on them. So bright things will, or bright parts of the image or the scene or whatever it is that they're viewing will generate higher levels of voltage and dark things will generate lower levels of voltage. So your eye tracker, it's sort of starting point, if you like, is essentially, you can think of it as like a spreadsheet containing the voltage readouts from all of these cells. Somehow it has to kind of make sense of those numbers. And that's what I'll talk about now. Before I go into detail on that, I just want to explain why it is that we track both the pupil and the corneal reflection. So you can see here these crosshairs, crosshairs there on the center of the pupil, but then there's this other set of crosshairs here that are marking the center of the corneal reflection. Why is it that we track both of those. You'd think if the pupil is moving as we rotate our eyes left or right or up or down, then surely if we just manage to figure out where on our images the pupil is, then we've, uh, we've done our job. But the pupil can move on the camera sensor, not just when the eye moves, but if the head moves. And the head will move even with a bite bar or a head movements, it's virtually impossible to truly limit the ability of people to move their heads. So how then do you disentangle a movement of the pupil that was the result of an actual rotation of the eye from a movement of the pupil on the camera sensor that was simply the result of a rotation of the head? This is where the corneal reflection comes in, and I'll, I'll spend some time trying to explain that. The fundamental point to grasp is that when you move your head, your pupil and your corneal reflection kind of move together. Whereas when the eye rotates, the relationship between the pupil and the corneal reflection changes. I'll illustrate this in a bit. But these are the fundamental ideas behind tracking both the pupil and the corneal reflection. Eye links, but especially the INIC 1000, the INIC 1000 Plus, by default, will use both the pupil and the CR. They can be put into pupil only mode tracking if required. So here's an illustration of this basic idea. Here's somebody's eye, and you can see looking at the pupil that they're looking here over to the left, here over to the right, here sort of slightly down, here slightly up, here they're looking straight ahead. And if you look at these images, you'll see that the, the location of the corneal reflection in all of these images is essentially in the same place. And that's because if you imagine the eye as a kind of perfectly rotating sphere, I think I've got an illustration. So the, the corneal reflection stays broadly in the same place. You can see it illustrated here in these photos. So here's somebody looking up, here somebody's looking a bit to the left, here they're looking closer to the right, so you can see the pupil has moved from here to here, and now the corneal reflection is overlapping with the pupil. But if you look at the relative location of this corneal reflection in the image as a whole, it's relatively unchanged, even here when the eye is moved upwards. The corneal reflection remains in the same kind of point in space, despite the eye rotations. Whereas in this image, in image D, where what you can see is that there's been a translation of the head position, somebody's moved their head over to the right, you can see that the relationship between the pupil and the corneal reflection remains the same. So while both of their locations on the camera sensor have shifted from one to the other, from A to D, the relative positions of the centers of the pupil and the corneal reflection are unchanged. And this really is the trick behind pupil 
corneal or pupil minus corneal reflection tracking. This is a final illustration. If you imagine this globe here is somebody's eye that can rotate. This torch is the infrared light source and it's shining onto that eye. It doesn't really matter where or how the globe's rotating, that corneal reflection stays broadly in the same position. But if you imagine painting a pupil on top of this globe, clearly as the eye rotates, the pupil's position changes. Does that make sense so far? So in this illustration, imagine this eye is a kind of robotic eye. It's completely fixed in space. It can't move left or right. You can see that when the eye rotates here to the left, the position of the pupil, if this grid represents the sensor, you know, the camera sensor, the, the little grid of light sensitive pixels, you can see that the pupil has changed location on that grid, but the corneal reflection hasn't. Similarly, when the eye rotates over to the right, the pupil has changed location, but the corneal reflection remains at, we give this a coordinate space, one, two, three, four, five, five comma two. And in each image, it doesn't matter where the eye rotates, corneal reflection stays the same. But in this lower image, what's happening is the eye is not rotating, but the head is moving. And here you can see that both the pupil and the corneal reflection move with respect to the eye tracking camera sensor, but the relationship between them, if we subtracted four comma two from, or I suppose four comma two for the pupil, we would get zero. And similarly, over here, the eyes moved or the, the head's moved, so the eye has moved on the camera sensor, but both the pupil and the corneal reflection have moved by the same amount. So if again, you subtract one from the other, you would get zero. In other words, you're able by subtracting the, the position of the corneal reflection from the position of the pupil on the camera sensor, you are able to essentially subtract out head movements. And that's really the kind of, the role of um, the host software is to identify the center of these two landmarks, the center of the pupil, the center of the corneal reflection on the camera sensor, then subtract one from the other to cancel out any movements in the pupil that were simply caused by movements of the head. Now, it sounds relatively straightforward, but it has to be able to do that at up to 2000 times a second. And the images it's receiving are quite large images. So that's what we'll move on to next. How does it go about that task of trying to identify the center of the pupil and the center of the corneal reflection? Um, it does that using various low level, very low level image processing algorithms. And essentially you can see here, the estimate of the pupil center is based on these dark blue pixels. And I'm going to talk about thresholding in the morning, in, the, in, in a minute. The idea is that these parts of the image are sufficiently dark that they've, they're below some threshold. And therefore, we can color them artificially, if you like, and then count up the number of colored pixels we've got and then do some maths to figure out where the center of that coherent blob of pixels is. The same for the corneal reflection. So when you're adjusting the thresholds on your eye tracker, something that happens sort of automatically if you're using remote mode, but something that you would do manually in head fixed mode, you would focus your camera and then check your pupil thresholds. We always advise that your pupil threshold is above 75. Your corneal threshold is somewhere between 200 and 240, something like that. These values, this pupil and corneal reflection threshold values, are nothing more or less than a, a grayscale value, where a value of zero would mean perfect pitch black, and a value of 255 would be perfect pure white. And essentially what we're telling the host computer when we adjust these thresholds is, is how black does something have to be? Or how dark does something have to be in this image for it to be potentially part of the pupil? And that's why you'll see lots of dark blue. If people have got dark blue or dark eyelashes, naturally dark eyelashes or if they're wearing mascara, for example, mascara is very, very black. 
and it will probably be even blacker in fact than the pupil which is why you'll often see people with blue eyelashes luckily the host software is very very clever and it can ignore blue eyelashes because it's looking for something that's a coherent circular blob of pixels so don't worry when you see blue in the eyelashes what matters as we'll see is the blue that's inside the pupil similarly with the corneal reflection the host computer image processing algorithms are trying to find a bright circular coherent blob of pixels so with the corneal reflection threshold what we're saying is how white does something have to be and again you will see lots of this light blue color in the overview image from the camera you will see pale skin will look may look white light blue again this doesn't matter it's entirely expected what matters is the light blue that we've got in the eye and that's why adjusting thresholds is so important if your host computer is trying to compute the center of a coherent blob of pixels if your pupil threshold is too low in other words you're saying something has to be really 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 dark in order to be a pupil then all of these dark pixels let me get my pointer back all of these dark pixels around the edge here and a little gap there are not dark enough so the eye tracking computer the host computer software doesn't know about them and can't take them into account when it's trying to compute the sensor that makes the computation a rather noisy affair a hit and miss affair and that's going to contribute noise to your data here when the thresholds have been adjusted appropriately you can see we've grabbed as many of these pixels as we can this is the opposite if the threshold's too high. In other words, we're saying it doesn't really have to be very, very dark at all for a pixel to be potentially part of the pupil. You can see that we've started to kind of potentially count these parts of the iris as the pupil. At the moment, in this image, that's not problematic, but if the person looked down so that these shadows kind of merge, then that would create problems again because you're altering the size and the shape of the pupil. The algorithms that are going to compute its center are going to get confused and return data that's not so useful. So that's why thresholds are so important. They're determining the data that the eye tracking computer is using to make the sort of fundamental computations it has to make about where the center of these landmarks, the pupil and the corneal reflection, really are. Similarly, when we adjust the corneal reflection, it's important that we try to grab as many of these pixels as many of these bright pixels as we can and feed them into the computation here it's, it's rather subtle it's hard to see but the threshold is too high we're basically saying something in this image would have to be pure pure white in order for it to be considered part of the corneal reflection and that's why you see this kind of white halo of unthresholded pixels we're only returning a very small group of pixels to the eye tracker to work with. Here we've grabbed many, many more of them. And here you can see the threshold is too low. We're now filling in potentially problematic parts of the eye. Like you can see a little bit of light blue down here. Again, it's not a problem now. The eye tracker is still working quite happily, but if that corneal reflection were to merge with some other of this light blue pixels it's going to cause problems for the image processing algorithms that i've been talking about whoops let me get my mouse back um and there's just a, a summary for people that download these slides later they may find useful but again the, the idea is that when we're adjusting the thresholds we're trying to maximize the amount of the pupil that we have thresholded for reasons that will become apparent soon and that maximize the amount of the corneal reflection that we have thresholded so that the image processing algorithms have the maximum amount of data to do their job on more data equals less noise for reasons that will come up it's another reason why focusing the camera is so important if the camera is unfocused the boundaries between what is and what isn't pupil and corneal reflection become much more blurred and see this kind of flare around the corneal reflection that you sometimes get if the camera isn't focused by focusing the camera we minimize this kind of ambiguity as to what pixels are and what pixels aren't possibly part of the pupil 
And that's important because there will always be ambiguity. If you think of this dark blue blob of pixels as the pupil, or you know, this black inner circle as the actual pupil, these dark blue pixels are the camera sensor pixels that are dark enough to be considered part of the pupil. There are always going to be pixels where it's pretty much 50-50, like this pixel here. Half of it's covered by a pupil, half of it isn't. So these become noise, whether or not that pixel does or doesn't raise above some threshold of grayness is going to depend on tiny, tiny changes of light, tiny, tiny changes of, of the eye position. And we want to try and minimize this sample to sample noise. So you can see these kind of pixels where it's potentially ambiguous whether or not they would be considered part of the pupil. But what we do, or what the host computer does, is it counts up all of the pixels that have met the criteria that are sufficiently dark to be considered being part of the pupil and performs essentially some kind of center of mass computation to determine where the center of that pupil is. And it does the same thing on the pixels that are thresholded as part of the corneal reflection. And these values, or in fact, the value of this location minus this location, so the value of the pupil center minus the value of the corneal reflection center in camera sensor coordinate space, if you like, that really is at the heart of your eye tracking data. That's what we call raw data and is stored in all of your data files. It's just not the kind of data that most of us choose to analyze. We prefer to look at calibrated gaze data because that actually will map onto where people were looking when they were looking at things on screen. But this raw data, after this first stage of image processing, is one of the sort of low level bits of information that we have in our eye tracker. So why is it important to try and grab as many of these pixels as we can when we're adjusting these thresholds? It kind of, I've hinted at this already, it's all about trying to minimize sample to sample noise. If, again, if you imagine a perfect artificial eye that's completely fixed and couldn't possibly move, unlike the human eye, which even during fixations is moving actually all the time with drifts and microsaccades. If you look at two subsequent pictures that the video camera takes, so this would be like millisecond one, then millisecond two, it may be that depending on light conditions, shadows, whatever, two of those pixels will change. So here in this image, you can see that we've kind of lost this pixel and gained these two pixels. Now, the host computer is trying to compute the center of this coherent blob of pixels. If it's got 500 pixels to do that on and only two of them change, then its estimate is gonna be broadly the same. In other words, there's gonna be little variance in where it thinks the eye is sample to sample. It's back, like being back in first year statistics, you know, it's, it's much better to have a sample size of 500 to compute a mean from than it is to have a sample size of five to compute a mean from. It's gonna be a much more stable, much more reliable estimate of the population mean the larger your sample. And that's really what you're trying to do when you try and grab and adjust the thresholds and grab as many pupil and corneal reflection pixels as you can. If you've only got a small number of pixels that are thresholded and two of them or a small number of them change, so here we've lost these two and gained these two, then you can see that the impact that this has, just this change of two pixels on the estimate of the center of where the eye is from the second to the first frame is much, much more dramatic. So that's really the rationale behind trying to um, grab as many pixels as we can when we're adjusting the thresholds. So hopefully that's given you some insight into the kind of mechanics and some of the under the hood image processing that's going on. And like I say, having an understanding of this stuff can really help you be aware of when the eye tracker might not be doing its job perfectly, what you might need to do in order to sort of make it do its job a bit better.
a bit more easily. The last thing I'm going to talk about is this idea of calibration. I've mentioned this concept of raw data, literally the value you get when you subtract the location of the corneal reflection from the location of the pupil in camera sensor space. This is a value that will give you eye position unconfounded by any small head movements. And it can be represented, if you like, by this vector between the pupil and the corneal reflection, which, as I've mentioned, will change with eye rotation, but not with head movement. So we have that. That's what the eye tracking computer is computing every millisecond as it's recording data. What we need, though, is where the person is looking at in some kind of more useful coordinate space, typically the screen pixel coordinates of the screen that the person is looking at. So if you had a 1920 by 1080 screen, then 00, zero would be the top left corner, 1920 by 1080 would be the bottom right corner. And we want to know where on that screen, which pixel is the person looking at. And to do that, we essentially build a regression model that allows us to map this raw, low-level eye tracking data onto our gaze coordinate reference frame. And we do that simply by presenting a number of targets, could be 9, 13, 5, it depends what calibration model you choose. And these targets have known locations in our desired space. So in our screen space, we know that that central target would be at 960,540, for example, on a 1920 by 1080 screen. The center of that screen would be 960,540. And that's where we present a target. And we wait and we listen. We ask the person to look at that target and we record our raw data. We see what raw values is the host computer giving us at that location. And we repeat this. We repeat this across nine, 13 locations. And from that input, a series, if you like, of pairs of bits of information, at each location we have where that location is in our screen coordinate system and what the eye tracker was giving us in terms of raw coordinates for where the eye was when it was looking at that location. And between those two pairs, between those pairs of inputs, we can create essentially a regression model that allows us to predict one from the other. So we will be able to predict where somebody is looking in the screen pixel space based on what raw data the eye camera is delivering based on its analysis of the images it receives. Just like we could measure people's height and their shoe size, and if we had a sufficiently decent sample, we could then predict people's shoe size based on their height. Even if we didn't have a six foot person in our sample, we would be able to build a regression model that would allow us to predict the shoe size of a six foot person based on all of the other heights and shoe sizes we have in our regression model. So simple linear regression just gives you a kind of amplifier and an offset. The eye tracking calibration model is in fact non-linear and it involves more than one dimension and is fairly complicated, but you can think of it as heart, at heart as a regression model that allows you to go from one coordinate space, the raw data, pupil minus CR and camera sensor space, and predict from that where somebody's looking in screen coordinate space. So again, if we go back to our idea of what the camera is seeing, it's seeing this pupil and a corneal reflection. The pupil changes as the eye rotates, but the corneal reflection stays put. If the eye moves, the relationship between them stays the same. So by subtracting one from the other, you can recover some kind of eye movement minus head movement. And that is our raw data, and we're collecting that raw information at each of nine lo known locations. And we're then mapping that onto the actual locations of our target in screen pixel coordinates. Now, again, having some understanding of that process gives us really useful insights into improving our ability to collect good, high quality data. And it's kind of obvious, once you've understood what's going on, just how important this calibration stage is. 
literally everything that you measure and analyze in your eye tracking data is a product of this model. So where the eye is in space, in your screen pixel coordinates, is the output of this calibration function. And if that calibration model itself is suboptimal, then your gaze data, its accuracy could be suboptimal. And generally what we aim for when we're doing a calibration is symmetry. What we want to give as the input into our regression model is a nice symmetrical set of raw data that is nice and balanced. If you have something like this example in the bottom right where one of your, to be the top right corner, is offset, the calibration maths will kind of pull this in. It's perfectly able to kind of cope with this and do something about it. But by pulling it in, you've kind of created little distortions and ripples elsewhere in the model. You'll get a much nicer, much more linear, much more stable set of gaze data if you give your calibration maths a nice bit of input. And by nice input, we mean symmetrical grids of crosses. And you can generally achieve that by making sure that your equipment is set up correctly, your screen isn't too close, you're not asking people to rotate their eyes beyond the trackable range of the system. This kind of outlier here typically happens when people are forced to rotate their eyes so much that the cornea reflection drops off the cornea or begins to drop off the cornea and its shape distorts. That's one of the reasons why we explain things like the trackable range. Um, So try to aim for nice symmetrical calibration grids and try to avoid these more distorted grids. If you see something like this, it's generally a good clue that something's a bit wrong with the kind of geometry of your physical setup. Probably your screen is too close, possibly your screen is too high, possibly some combination of both of those. It's generally quite easy to avoid this and you will find that your data is much improved as a result of this. I thought while I'm here, I'll just finish on a few extra calibration tips. Um, generally, in my opinion, it's a good idea to do a manual calibration. So the eye tracker, the eye link software will, if you just press the space bar, kind of wait to find a fixation. And then when it finds a fixation, it will draw the next calibration task and it'll do that automatically. That generally works fine for most participants, particularly very practiced ones. Often though, I find that people will kind of try to guess where the eighth or the ninth target will be and generally get it wrong, in which case the eye tracker doesn't know that they're not looking in the right place. So it will just accept that. Um, it's always worth motivating your participants to really look at the dot in the middle of the calibration target. People can see things quite well, even if they're not looking at them precisely. You see what I mean? We've got one or two degrees of reveal vision. So we're not too bothered exactly how accurately we look at something unless we're really told to. So tell people to look at the dot in the middle of the target. Um, there's a sort of art to deciding when to put the next target. If you go too soon, you don't give people a chance to make these little corrective saccades that they should be making if they're well motivated. But equally, if you go too late, then their eye may begin to drift. It's about once a second is my kind of, what you'd aim for, but it's slightly faster, slightly slower in different people. You get a feel for the rhythm eventually. Um, if you do see that you've got a poor point in your grid, you can always press the backspace key on the host computer or even on the eye track, on the stimulus computer. This will unwind the calibration one point at a time. And another last bit of advice on calibration. If you're using remote mode, the target sticker mode, then it's much better to use a 13 or a five point calibration. Save the nine point calibration for head fixed. Um, you, you get nice linear data that way. I'm gonna skip past this. This is just looking at the other features of the eye tracking host software. One of its purposes is not just to do all of this complex image processing, which it does. It's also to provide you the experimenter with some live feedback about what's going on. And you can use this feedback to make sure that the eye tracker is still accurate, to see whether you need to recalibrate, for example. 
one of the questions I get asked all the time about calibration is how often I should, should I recalibrate? And the advice I always give is you should only ever recalibrate as often as you have to. And that could be never. But what you need is lots and lots of opportunities built into your experiment that allow you to determine whether or not you should recalibrate. In other words, whether or not the eye tracker is still accurate, the calibration model is still valid. And if that evidence, typically these are drift checks or drift corrects, if those are telling you that there's something wrong, then you have the opportunity to correct it and you correct it by recalibrating. It's never a good idea, in my opinion, to recalibrate every 10th trial or whatever just because. Because it may be that your current calibration model is perfectly good, in which case you risk replacing it with a slightly less good model. So if the model's good, then keep it. If the model needs changing and you'll get ideas as to whether that does from drift checks and from the live feedback provided by the host PC, then intervene and recalibrate. It's just an example of the real-time feedback. You can tell the eye tracker is nice and accurate. The gaze cursor is still on the, on the words. This kind of feedback is used in things like smooth pursuit tasks, maybe anti saccade tasks, where you've got very, very rapid eye movements that might not be visible or noticeable just by looking at the gaze cursor. It can be quite useful. Um, the last thing that the host computer is doing, and I'm not going to talk about this now because it'll probably be the topic of another webinar, is it's parsing the data. So in real time, it's essentially trying to find saccade. So it's looking at the velocity of the eye, and it's using that velocity to information to make decisions about whether the eye is in a saccade, in other words, it's moving rapidly towards somewhere, or whether it's in a fixation, it's relatively not moving. And if you look at the raw output of the eye tracker, these are samples, you're getting one every millisecond, you will see that they are interspersed with these parsed events, and they always come in pairs. ESAC means end saccade, S fix means X start of the fixation. It's worth bearing in mind that fixations in eye link systems are defined as not saccades. So the start of a fixation is defined by the fact that the previous saccade is ended. Eye velocity is dropped below a threshold. The saccade is therefore ended. Because the saccade is ended, we must therefore now be in a fixation. So you will find a similar pair of events further down this recording where you'd have an E fix for end fixation and an S sac for start saccade. And again, the fixation is only ended because we've detected the start of a saccade. So the host computer is essentially looking for rapid eye movements. And when it finds one, it flags that and flagging the onset of a rapid saccade defines the offset of the preceding fixation. The last thing I'll cover is why we have this link, why eye links are called eye links in, a sense, in essence. We always have a two computer approach. We have one computer, the laptop, the host PC, or the, sorry, in this case, the laptop host PC, which is doing the image processing via the processes I've been outlining in the last hour. That needs to run on its own computer because its job is intensely complex and it has to run in an operating system that will allow it to do these complex computations at very, very high speeds. There are equal constraints on your stimulus side. So you would like to be able to present stimuli with precise onsets. And again, that's difficult if you have the same computer trying to both present your stimuli and analyze all of these images being returned from the eye tracker. So we, we use a two computer system. One computer devotes itself to figuring out where you're looking. The other computer, your stimulus computer, display computer we call it, devotes itself to presenting your stimuli. And the link is what allows these two computers to talk to each other. And it's important to understand that that's a bi-directional communication. Your stimulus computer tells the eye tracking computer when things happened. This is critical so that you can map up things like saccades, fixations in your analysis to when things were on the screen. So when there's a fixation cross on the screen, the moment that appears, we send a message to the eye tracker saying fixation cross appeared. When the targets appeared, we send a message 
to the eye tracking computer saying that the targets are viewed. So that's communication from the display computer to the host computer and it's critical. But there's a continual flow of information going the other way from the host computer back to your display computer. And that flow of information is the result of all of those rapid online computations that allow the host computer to know where the eye is in screen pixel coordinates at any millisecond in time. And that information comes back continually and can be used by your display computer to do these kinds of clever gaze contingent tasks where things appear or disappear depending on where you're looking or trials only start if you fixate across in the middle of the screen, for example. The, the sort of round trip delay, if you like, between the eye physically moving, the camera being able to take a picture of that, sending that picture to the host computer, the computer, the host computer doing all of its complex image processing algorithms to extract the raw data, feeding that raw data through the calibration model and returning the gaze data. All of that happens within three milliseconds which is incredibly fast and, much, and fast enough that your, by the time your stimulus computer gets that information, it's ready to draw something else based on that information. Um, I've gone on way longer than I thought I would, so I, apologies for that. I'm gonna stop it there. I hope that was useful or interesting. I'm gonna stop the recording now, but if people have got questions, I'll hang around and, uh, and answer them.